Welcome back to Domain 5 of the Security Plus Exam Cram Series 2024 edition. And here we are in Section 5.6, our final installment in the series. We're going to have a short chat today about security awareness practices. We'll start with the discussion of the importance of anomalous behavior recognition by our employees, and then we're going to review a few recommended topics for user awareness training sessions. Then we're going to look at the training process from end to end, from development and execution, and into ongoing reporting and monitoring to ensure our efforts remain effective. Should be helpful information both on the job and on the exam. Let's dig in. Welcome back to Domain 5 of the Security Plus Exam Cram Series 2024 edition. And here in Section 5.6, we'll be focused on security awareness practices. The syllabus asks us to implement security awareness practices, which is another way of saying various forms of security awareness training. So we'll touch on topics like phishing, anomalous behavior recognition, which means helping our users to recognize risky, unexpected, or unintentionally bad behavior an array of practices around user guidance and training, reporting and monitoring to monitor the efficacy of our efforts, and some end-to-end -end examination of the process, including development and execution. But before we dig into the syllabus here, we're going to get into some foundational material quickly around social engineering. Helping our users to understand the principles of social engineering lie at the core of teaching them how to make better decisions when it comes to protecting our organization from threat. So there are six or seven principles of social engineering, depending on who you talk to, we're going to go through seven. The first is authority, an attacker citing position, responsibility, or affiliation that grants the attacker the authority to make the request. Whether that's impersonating a third party authority or someone of authority within the organization, that's a common approach. Intimidation, suggesting that you may face negative outcomes if you do not facilitate access or initiate a process. Consensus, claiming that someone in a similar position or a peer of yours has carried out the same task in the past. Scarcity, a request focused on limited opportunity, diminishing availability that requires we get this done in a certain amount of time. It's similar to urgency, which we'll touch on in a moment. Scarcity tends to focus on quantity. Next, we have familiarity. Attempting to establish a personal connection, often citing mutual acquaintances using social proof to establish a connection, a personal connection. We call this liking as well, meaning it's an attempt to get the victim to like the attacker because we'll do things for people we like, right? Next, there's trust, citing knowledge and experience, sometimes even assisting the target with an issue to establish a relationship, to build trust. And finally, urgency, time sensitivity that demands immediate action, similar to scarcity, sometimes used together with scarcity. Limited time, limited quantity, limited opportunity. What these principles have in common is they are all attempts to get users to circumvent our standard security policies and procedures. So at the core of security awareness practices and training is to teach our users to recognize bad actors using these principles to get them to step outside their normal decision-making process. And to round out the foundation here, I want to touch on some social engineering attacks. And at a high level, there are two categories of social engineering attacks. There are physical attacks and virtual attacks. And the physical would include attacks like tailgating and shoulder surfing and dumpster diving. On the virtual side, we have an array of what are largely fishing variants along with the watering hole. But together with those seven elements of social engineering, those seven principles, you'll have a good foundation for what we're dealing with, what we're trying to teach our users when it comes to security awareness. Because bottom line, in the world today, email is the number one way in the door to an organization for ransomware. Phishing is that delivery mechanism. 
So to summarize, social engineering is an attempt by an attacker to convince someone to provide info like a password or to perform an action they wouldn't normally perform, like clicking on a malicious link. And they'll often even try to gain access to the IT infrastructure or the physical facility. But as I mentioned, phishing is that number one way in the door. It's commonly used to trick users into giving up personal information, accounts, passwords, click a link, open an attachment, and you'll want to know the phishing variants out there. So you have spear phishing that targets specific groups of users. You have whaling, which tends to target high-level executives, or whales as they're called sometimes. Vishing, which is voicemail-based phishing. It's phone-based. And smishing, which is text-based messaging on mobile. But it's the number one cyber attack. It's an entry point for ransomware. You want to know these variants for the exam and on the job, actually. The official study guide also mentions that the best defense for social engineering techniques is security awareness training. Now, we see spam and spim show up in the official study guide as well, so more phishing variants. So spam you've heard of, no doubt, which is unsolicited email generally considered an irritant, but we defeat that with strong filtering. And we have SPIM, which is spam over instant messaging, also generally considered an irritant. But your IM, your instant messaging and your mobile providers are providing some protection here. For all of your major carriers, now you can download an app that will identify malicious text messages, for example, and send those to the bin. But you want to create usernames that are not easily guessable. You don't want to add your ID to a, a public directory on an instant messaging platform to so try to maintain some anonymity, for sure. But do bear in mind, while these are generally considered an irritant, they're not always just an irritant. Both are delivery channels for ransomware. Let's talk through some physical attacks. We have dumpster diving, which is gathering important details from things people have thrown in the trash. This can target individuals or organizations. This could be the bin behind the corporate office. This could be your rubbish bin at the end of your drive that you carry down for weekly delivery. So we want to make sure we don't put sensitive information into the bin. We want to securely shred any paper that contains information we wouldn't want external entities to see. Secure shredding typically involves shredding in two directions. It's not going to be just shredding one direction into long strips. It'll be doing kind of a crisscross. Next, we have tailgating. When an unauthorized individual might follow you through an open door without badging in themselves. This is usually not an accident. Then we have eliciting information. This is leveraging social engineering techniques. So here we'd see casual conversation being used to extract information without arousing suspicion, which means they're going to be employing some of those seven principles of social engineering to gain trust. But you'll often see these attempts involving very complex cover stories to provide social proof, to provide that connection to someone within the organization to make it sound as though what they are asking is okay. Then there's shoulder surfing, which is a criminal practice where thieves will steal your personal data by spying over your shoulder. And it's important we teach users to be aware of this because it can happen anywhere on any device. It can happen in the office with a consultant or other visitor in the office. It can happen at a coffee shop. Anywhere with any device, really. Computer, phone, etc. Next, we have farming, which is an online scam where... A website's traffic is manipulated through DNS and it redirects the user to a different malicious website. That's a, a portmanteau of uh, the words fishing and farming. Okay, that's some foundation. That's some background. Now let's shift to the items we see in the syllabus. So phishing, as we saw, is a deceptive attempt to steal sensitive information by masquerading as a trustworthy entity in an electronic communication. Might be email, might be a text message, might be a voicemail. So what we want to do to prepare our employees, number one, is to conduct simulated phishing campaigns to test employee awareness and their preparedness. 
This can help identify knowledge gaps that require additional training. And what you'll find is some of your online email platforms for the enterprise or third-party products allow you to create very realistic simulated phishing messages so you can test your employees and those who click on the message and fail can be redirected to training in real time. Where that malicious link in that simulated phishing email, when they click on it, says, hey, you've been phished, let's go turn this into a training opportunity. We also need to teach our employees to recognize a phishing attempt. So training employees on red flags associated with phishing emails. Generic greetings, typos, urgency, suspicious attachments or links, a known sender name but unknown sender email address, and then how to respond to reported suspicious messages. So we need to establish a clear procedure for employees to report suspicious emails to the IT security team. This should include instructions on how to forward the email without compromising security. This way the IT security team can look into that. We can forward that on to the AI service that trains our cloud email protection. All your anti-phishing, anti-malware email protection these days uses AI, uses machine learning. So anything your users report is generally speaking going to roll into that service and train the service to do better. Next on the syllabus, anomalous behavior recognition. Our employees should be trained to recognize when risky, unexpected, and unintentional behavior takes place. So let me give you some examples in each of these three categories. So risky would be activities like downloading files from untrusted websites, clicking on suspicious links in an email, sharing passwords or other sensitive info with other users, leaving work devices unintended in public, unexpected situations, a sudden increase in failed login attempts for a user. So we're going to recognize this from the IT side, right? A user accessing sensitive information outside their normal duties, working unusual hours outside of their normal schedule, transferring large amounts of data to personal devices. This could indicate a malicious insider. This could also indicate a compromised identity or device. And then we have the unintentional. So a user using weak passwords and also using the same password repeatedly across multiple sites. We can do a fair bit to prevent that. A user falling victim to a phishing attack and entering credentials, which we address through awareness training, through phishing simulations printing sensitive documents and leaving them unattended. We'd certainly want to prohibit this in a company policy, but also something worth reminding our users of periodically in our security awareness training. And then there's the very common oversharing sensitive documents, what we'd call a data leak. Next on the syllabus, we see user guidance and training. And there are several important topics that should be included in end user security training programs. We see an official list or a quasi official list, at least in the official study guide. So the company's security policy handbook should include a section with guidance on phishing awareness. And this should also include guidance on reporting those suspicious messages. We should codify in our policy handbooks what we have trained users in our periodic security awareness training. Situational awareness. So train employees on the evolving threat landscape, emphasizing the increased risk of phishing attacks in a remote work environment and teaching them to open emails from unknown senders with caution. We should educate employees about the dangers of insider threats, such as disgruntled coworkers who may attempt to steal data or interrupt business operations. This can help our employees to identify what may be potentially malicious requests from coworkers. But we also want to make sure that our entire IT and IT security staff are aware of the hallmarks, the common signs of insider threat. Mass download, mass upload, mass deletion. Doing a lot of work outside normal work hours. Continuing down the user guidance list. Password management. We want to train employees on strong password creation and management practices and advise against password reuse across multiple sites and encourage the use of password managers. Removable media and cables. So reminding employees about the security risks associated with using removable 
media, USB drives, external hard drives, and public charging cables. Training should guide use of authorized devices and data encryption. Which means also from a security perspective, we should have controls in place that only allow the use of known approved removable media types, which you can typically control through policy-based administration using the ID of the various device types. Also on the list, social engineering. So educating employees on different social engineering techniques commonly used in phishing attacks. Training users on those seven principles of social engineering. I have seen that play out in the real world and it works. Over time and repetition, it creates a savvy user that can recognize social engineering attempts. Okay, this user guidance and training list is a long one, so to wrap it up, the last couple here. We have operational security, so training employees on operational security principles like being mindful of the information they share online or in public places and risks of unsecured Wi-Fi networks or public computers. Hybrid and remote work are very common these days, so we need to develop specific security guidelines for remote work setups and include guidance on home Wi-Fi and work data on personal devices. So making sure our employees set up a secure home Wi-Fi network, and if we allow work data on personal devices, that we establish some guardrails and best practices. So let's talk development and execution. In developing our security awareness training, we want to develop training materials that are interesting, right? Engaging, informative, and tailored to the specific needs of the organization and its employees. We want to consider using also a variety of training methods. Everyone benefits from the employment of multiple training methods like online modules, interactive in-person workshops, video presentations, whether live or recorded. People have different preferences for learning, so we want to hit them all. Execution. So launching the security awareness training program across the organization, ensuring all employees participate regardless of location. Hybrid training sessions, on-site and remote, are very common, where some users are in a room with a live instructors and others are on uh, Zoom watching from home. And we need to promote the training program internally and encourage employees to actively participate and ask questions. Many organizations will establish learning goals and send out automated reminders to the users so they complete the training periodically by specific deadlines. And we need to regularly measure the effectiveness of the training program through assessments and reporting and make adjustments. So let's talk about assessment and reporting. So reporting and monitoring. So initially, we could conduct an assessment to gauge employees' current level of security awareness regarding phishing and related threats. Now this could be achieved through surveys or knowledge-based tests, quizzes of a sort. And that can help us establish a baseline. And then we establish recurring training, scheduling regular security awareness training sessions to reinforce best practices and keep employees updated on the latest phishing tactics, the latest threats that they're going to face in their mailbox and out in the world. And we want to monitor reporting trends to identify areas where employees might need additional training or support. It is a fact that Regular updates to training material are necessary to address evolving threats and employees' weak areas. So some companies will deliver training annually, others semi-annually. I'm a big fan of quarterly so we can keep employees apprised and gain that benefit of spaced repetition where we are having regular touch points with our employees to make them just a little bit better every time. Just as recurring contact with material, space repetition helps you with exam prep. It also helps your employees. My friends, that's a wrap on section 5.6 and indeed the final installment for the Security Plus Exam Cram series for the 701 exam. I hope you have enjoyed the series. I will post the consolidated domain 5 video in the next day or so, as well as a full consolidated course with all five domains in the next week or so. As always, if you have any questions, put a comment below the video, reach out directly on LinkedIn. Happy to help anywhere I can. I will look forward to seeing you on future exam prep sessions. And until next time, take care and stay safe.